Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to the EdCollab gathering. Uh, this is now session two, workshop number seven. And this particular workshop is going to be presented by Roz and Chris Linder. Um, Roz, who I've had the pleasure of working with in the past with these workshops, um, is a literary consultant. She's the author of six books. In fact, in March, she just released uh, a new title, the, the Big Book of Details. And she's an educator with experience that ranges from the elementary level to the college level. Um, Chris, on the other hand, is a former educator and he's a current author and he's passionate about fostering an interest in the art of writing. Um, he actually has a book entitled Be For Real, The New Survival Guide for Dads of Color and that's coming out this May, so be sure to check that out. Um, today, uh, we're lucky enough to have Roz and Chris talking to us about uh, teaching students to elaborate and add details to their writing. Now, if you want to get involved um, in our discussion, you could see below my name there is our session hashtag, which is hashtag the Ed Collab Gathering, and then a space, and then seven. So make sure you have that space in there. So that's hashtag the Ed Collab Gathering, space, seven. And with all that said now, um, I'd like to turn it over to Roz and Chris. So, Roz and Chris, you're on. Hi, everyone. So excited that you have chosen to share your Saturday with us. So we're going to jump right in because we have a lot of good stuff we want to talk to you about. And we're really talking about helping students to elaborate and craft details. And I want to tell you a little bit about how this came to be. Um, a lot of the things that we're going to talk about, too, before we get to that, come from my new book, The Big Book of Details. So excited. All the work that we are gonna to talk to you about, it's all in here. So super excited to share that with you. And basically the work that we're talking about came from a problem. We both have been teachers everywhere from kindergarten up to college between the two of us. High school level, yeah, middle school. Elementary, we've done it all. And despite what grade level we taught, we both had the same problem that we kept seeing when we were teaching writing. We would have a student that would write something, and you know, you conference with them, you look at their work, and you notice that they really need to add more detail. And what do we tell them? Go back and add details. Go back and add details. But when they come back to us, it's usually not better. It's longer, but not better. And we notice a pattern. Um, and I think it's because of the way we teach students when they're really young that a sentence has a subject, and a predicate. So when you add add detail, what they do is add adjectives and adverbs at best. Yeah. And so you just see that all along. So you might have a sentence that says, you know, there was a yellow box. When you add add detail, you want them to do something different with it. But they come back to you and it says something like, you know, it was a big, long, oh, yellow. Yeah. Bus. And you're looking at it and you're like, what is this? But you don't know how to tell them how they really can add descriptive details. So we tried to figure out what can we do to help our students, whether they were third graders or fifth graders. It didn't matter. They had the same problem. And so we started searching for solutions and we kind of really dug into a lot of different books to see what are the ideas. And we came across this idea of sharing mentor text. And we were really excited about it. We brought this, this idea back to our kids like, hey, you know what? look at some of the literature out there and let's try to find some of the things that these authors do. And we thought we had the solution, but when we went into our classrooms, what we, we found wrong. were people, the, the students really couldn't look at what they were reading because they weren't reading anything. There and, wasn't anything there for them to grasp onto. And so what we realized is that we had a special situation. We both taught in Title I schools, we both had kids who honestly were below grade level. And we realized there was a connection between reading and writing. Good readers tended to be good writers. And we wondered why. And we realized through all that reading, they were picking up examples and ideas and learning. We thought about our own writing as kids. I, I always talk about Judy Bloom. Judy Bloom taught me how to write. I read so many of her novels and Beverly Cleary. And that's how I learned about rich description. So we thought about that in reference to our kids, and we realized they weren't proficient readers, so they weren't exposed to all these techniques. And I wanted them to have the experiences that I had. I read and I learned how to punctuate dialogue 
from Beverly Cleary, from reading all her dialogue. I'm sure you have some of those same examples. Sure, I used to read uh, The Outsiders by Essie Hinton every year from like middle school on. Um, and I really enjoyed the way that Essie Hinton would describe the scene um, and really put you in the place of being a greaser, re being a sales yeah. back in the 60s in Oklahoma. Um, so you pulled that into your writing. And I would pull that into my writing when, you know, I found that and it was unconscious yeah. at that time. But yeah. looking back, you see that those tools come from reading. Good, reading good writing. So once we figured that out, we said, okay, let's figure out what to do. We have students that are not strong readers. If we bring great literature to them, yeah, they might learn a little bit, but it would take probably years. And so we decided to kind of reverse it. Instead of hoping that they would read and learn cool strategies, we decided what if we, as their teacher, teachers, would identify those moves that the good writers make and maybe just Bring those. those and teach those to the kids. So what we did was we started digging into all of our favorite books. I mean, books from elementary age up to high school. And we just started pouring over them and rereading them and saying, okay, what are these authors doing? What makes this book so good? And we started literally taking note cards, post-it notes. Yeah, writing down lists. Everything. Just, yeah. <laughs> Pulling page numbers. And, going, and we came up with like, like, like 40 or 50 of these. Yeah, really good examples. And then we went through and categorized and we're like, okay, what do these things have in common? And in the end, we had this huge list and it was kind of like, okay, these are the things our writers need. And we decided, you know, we're gonna throw out what we were doing before. Why don't we take these moves for crafting details directly to our students? And we decided to form our lessons around that. So at the time, Chris was a high school student, a high school student, a high, <laughs> a high school, school teacher. teacher. I just I wish. Back <laughs> and I was an elementary um, teacher and we decided, you know what, let's take these same moves and see what happens. And those experiences are the things that helped us come up with the ideas for the big book of details. And we found that it didn't matter how old you were. These moves help kids really elaborate and change their writing in yes. really powerful ways. So we're very excited about that. Right. And so we did a lot of reading and we basically became teachers and we read like writing teachers. Whenever we write a book, we were like, ooh, that is a good move. Right. How do we take that and bring it back to our students? Now, finding the moves was step one. But then we had to kind of practice and figure out a clear process to teach it to our students. So we have a couple steps, and we're going to share those with you. We're going to share some of the moves to help students elaborate and craft details and kind of walk you through some of the things that we did and that we learned. Okay. Let's uh, jump right into it with... You want to um, share? Which one you want to share with them? Uh, let's do Zoom In. Okay, let's do that. So we're going to talk about crafting details. We've already told you that. You can see that up on the screen. And let's talk about one of the moves that we have. All right, so Zoom In is basically a, a way of presenting to the, the reader the exact points that you want to bring forward as a... Mm -hmm. As really writer. focusing on one idea. And kids didn't know this. They would just write descriptions. And we realized we had been teaching them incorrectly. We've been telling them, use sensory language, tell what it smells like, looks like, go and paint this broad picture. But zoom in is the opposite. We taught them that, you know what, good writers focus on a very specific point, And they really go in and describe it. So we found pieces in books. And that's what you see on your screen here. We have three different pieces. And we'll talk about how these are examples of Zoom In. And we actually brought these to our students to say, hey, look, this is what a real writer does. So let's look at some of these examples. Let's look at the first one. Caroline and Wendy started another game of tic-tac-toe while Bruce went to work on his nose. He has a very interesting way of picking it. First, he works on one nostril and then the other. And whatever he gets out, he sticks on a piece of yellow paper inside of his desk. Now, I have to giggle at that. It's from the master, Judy Bloom. I love that example. <laughs> Kids love it, too. They do. They do. <laughs> but it shows how, you know what? She didn't paint a picture of the room. We don't know what the room looks like. We don't know what Carolyn looks like. We don't know what Wendy looks like. But she decided, hey, we're going to focus on this nose right here. And it really let her paint the picture. And the kids, when they saw this, they were like, wow. That's a thing? 
And this gave them a very explicit strategy. Yes. They were able to, and, and I don't know if you have this experience, but if I get them to write about something kind of gross, kind of disgusting, <laughs> they yeah. throw themselves into it. They get all into it. So <laughs> they're really into picking out every single detail of whatever he picked out of his nose, whether it's, you know, was it green? Was it slimy? We've was, spent a lot of time with this mood writing about very gross things. But for whatever reason, the kids get into that. And we don't care. We want them to test drive the mood. We want them to practice the mood. And then that's just the first step. Showing them is not enough. I am big on visuals. So one of the things we did a lot, we wrote together. And we wrote on large chart paper. So we have the shared sense of writing. So here's an example of the writing we did after we explored these pieces with um, a middle school class. The brown mesh hammock slowly swayed from left to right. Somehow a breeze, which never reached any of the campers, always managed to help the hammock keep a steady rhythm from left to right over and over again. Covered by the shade of those two massive trees, the hammock almost seemed to mock the campers and their sweat-soaked bodies. Left to right, left to right. So we created this as a class, literally from a picture of a hammock with two trees around it. And the kids loved it because they got to see what it meant to zoom in on something. So what we did here was we showed them what it looks like in real literature and a real book, how real authors do it. Then we were able to present a chart of shared writing. And these steps are critical. I need to show you what it looks like. And I'm going to scaffold and scaffold. We're going to work together and write. I'm going to give you some visual reminders of that writing. And then finally, I'm going to give you a chance to test drive it. So if you pull some lessons out of here, we see several steps we want to follow. Be very explicit, write together, and give kids chances to test it out. So we're going to share a couple other moves, but this is just a really good example that we really fell in love with and really enjoyed. Um, so the next one we're going to share with you is one of my favorites. We call it the opposite side move. Opposite side is basically telling your side of the story, but also telling the other side of the issue as well. It's counterclaims. The counterclaims that works great in argument writing, persuasive writing, when you have to present both sides of an issue. But we found that we had a problem when we would tell kids to present both sides. They would get lost. And you've probably experienced this. You tell them to acknowledge the counterclaim, and they begin to develop the counterclaim, and they kind of get lost in their writing. They dig deeper and deeper, and kind they get, get a little, yeah, yeah, too much detail. So we went through, and we got several informational texts. And these are three that we're going to show you really quickly. These are three that we showed the um, kids, and they all come from informational texts. And we wanted them to see, look, this is how you acknowledge a counterclaim. This is how you do an opposite side move. Some people think that recycling is the answer and devote all their energy to that. Of course, recycling is important, but there are better ways. I love that because it's just simple. It says, hey, you know what? Some of us think recycling works. Some of us think, yeah, there's some other ways to do this. And we did a little bit more research and a lot more digging with this move, and we started to see that authors use very specific sentence starts. And we said, you know what? We're trying to be explicit. Why don't we collect those and bring them to our students? And we chose to make an anchor chart with those. Yes. So a lot of the sentences would start with something like, some people think, or many people suggest, some might say. And these are all collected. Like these are from real pieces of text. And we got the kids to see this is what an author does when he wants to acknowledge a counterclaim. And something about that visual that you see on your screen right now, being up, was so powerful for the kids. When they wanted to try this move, they seen it in real text. They have practiced it with me or Chris as the teacher. And it didn't matter what grade they were in. But now they have a scaffold, something they can go to if they're kind of stuck. They're not sure where to start. And we kept those visuals up. Every single time we introduced a move. So this is just an example of what we did for that. But it was so authentic because it came from real books. It shows them what real authors do. Now, with the charts, we're big on reinforcing and practicing. We didn't just leave it there. Anytime we could work together with the students to give them chances to test drive a move, we totally did it. Here's a shot I'm going to show you here. 
kind of take a minute and look at that. This was so powerful because what we did, we used chart paper and we got the big six by eight post-it notes. And we did that because we wanted this chart to be reusable. And we did a lot of different things with it. Chris, how did you use this when you were working with your high school students? This is a great thing to use when you want to pair up the kids and let them work things out on their own. Just pair them up. Let one, one of the students come up with one viewpoint and the other come up with the opposing side, the, the opposite side. Um, and then at first you would have them kind of just call you over and let them check you. But then uh, let them go up to the, the chart in the front of the room, put their points up there and defend those points. Put those points up there and, and share them with the class. So for example, we have the first one there. There are some people who think that animal testing is okay. I think that no product should be tested on animals. And they don't have to argue it. They just put that up there. To and that's what they would put in their writing. It, it, it helped. It was really fun, too. The kids liked to do this. When I did it with elementary school students, I made about three charts, and I put them in groups of four or five, and I just gave them the post-it notes, and I let them go to town based on different things we were reading in class. And it was really cool because they got to test drive the mood. The key is that we introduce these moves by showing real text, we work with the kids to craft examples of that move, but then we've got to give them practice. Think about how we learn in real life. You don't just get on a bike and ride away. You have a lot of practice. You have someone holding on to the back of it. And so we're kind of trying to do that with students as well. And so I want to show a quick sample of some student work. This is from, um, I think, a sixth grader. And we were reading a lot of text about whether or not the driving age should be lowered. And so the discussion was, should it be lowered? Should it stay the same? Or should it be raised? And so I want to show this piece here because this was done in about maybe three or four minutes. But this student was very conscious about using the move. And so I know you guys can see it. We'll read it out loud just in case it's not clear. Some young children think the driving age should be lowered. But in reality, 13-year-olds are not ready for the responsibility of driving. Imagine a world of young drivers driving when they can barely reach the gas pedal. All right, so if you notice that first sentence, all they did was acknowledge that some people think that the driving age should be lower and that they think that, hey, we're not ready for that responsibility. What I love about this is the intentionality. This student is doing this on purpose, and it's just cool to see that they can make those decisions on their own. So when we think about work like this, it makes me happy when I see samples like that because I want my kids to have a toolkit. I'm trying to fill this toolkit with writing strategies. Those are the things we call moves. So if I introduce one move to them and another move to them, eventually they have so many options that when they come over and you're like, I need you to add more detail, they're not like, I don't know what to do. They can go to their mental toolkit they can use the scaffolds around the room to help them. And produce and, great writing. Yes, and you kind of get to step back as the teacher. Isn't that the best part where you have introduced so many moves? And you can just step back and you're like, okay, they know how to add detail because I was explicit. I gave them those visual aids and I showed them what it looks like in real text. So that was really powerful. And we started to realize we need to do this over and over again. How can we replicate this? And so that's what we try to try to do. And so we developed 46 moves, and we're going to show you a few more and walk you through what we did and show you some samples um, from our kids. So the opposite side is up now. Another one that we used was called Just Like That. On your screen, you'll see some examples that we pulled from real books. And what I like about this is that it has a cool name. It's called Just Like That. For me, teaching fifth graders, they were like, yeah, that's simple. I get that. But you have a lot of other opportunities, too. I think Your you older kids will instantly realize that, hey, these are similes. We're using similes here or metaphors. In this case, we're using similes because we're using the word like. And it lets you kind of choose how to go further if you want to. But I found that naming things was really powerful. It made it a real thing. So when they came over for conferences, I could say, well, what are you trying to do? Or, hey, did you notice it just like that in that author's text? So let's take a look at these. And if you notice these titles, oh, the Watsons go to Birmingham for the mixed up files and this case will be frank. Wow, these are great books that kids love. So we'll share an example. You can see them on your screen. And these are the same examples we shared with our kids. It was one of those super duper cold Saturdays. One of those days that when you breathe out, your breath kind of hung frozen in the air like a hunk of smoke. 
and you could walk along and look exactly like a train blowing out big, fat, white puffs of smoke. I love this one here because I think it's so meaty, but when you contrast that with the next one, which is a simple one, it gives them a, a range of possibilities. So we spend a lot of time for this move, for example, studying these particular books, and we showed them this is what an author does when he wants to paint a picture. And so the kids were able to add that move into their toolkit. And then just like we did with the other moves, however, a few more we have here too. This is one of my favorites, so I <laughs> have to admit I had to put in a lot here. Um, you want to read one or two of those? Sure. Moss and ferns, vines and orchids hang from branches like the beards of wise wizards. Kids always love that. <laughs> the beards of wise wizards, they try to use that again in so many different ways. And sure. you guys can see the other ones. We'll read one more. It shone like silver, looking somehow like a tiny building rising out of the mounds of rubble and earth. So these are the kind of examples we share with kids. And they really enjoyed when we did this because it was kind of fun, like we're exploring books, but we followed the same process. We pulled out explicit moves, we showed them what it looks like when a real author uses that move, and then we went to our own standby. We made anchor charts so we could practice and write together. So here's an example of one of those that we did for this particular move. This was a fun activity with the kids. And on the left side, you'll see a bunch of items listed there. I literally just went through the house and picked up a few random things. So I brought in a rock and a toy car and a crayon and a handmade necklace. And I said, guys, if you want to practice this move, let's do this together. I want you to choose two of these items and tell me how you might be just like that. And they got in groups and they talked and communicated and we wrote their responses on the right side. And if you'll notice, they came up with some pretty good things. Um, my, one of my favorites is um, the rock. Um, I can be difficult to move or change. But the whole practice was to get them thinking about how to test drive the move. And we wanted to be consistent with that. And we found that the more that we practiced with kids, the more that we gave them opportunities to work collaboratively, to have conversations, and just to test drive the moves, the more it got embedded mentally. So we had a really good combination with the visuals, the practice, and soon the move became their own, which was very powerful for us. And I'm gonna show you a piece of writing where you can kind of see a student using this move. And you'll see a lot of moves in there, but I just want you to see kind of the end point. We asked students to talk about a person that was important to them. And we have two students up here. Each of these are, um, one's a seventh grader, one's an eighth grader. And let's start with the one on the left. This is a student who decides to write about Jenna. And I want you to kind of look at her writing. It looks really good. But when I go back in, because I taught her, I know what every sentence is doing. I can look at it and go, oh, she made a just like move. Oh, she made this move here. She made a sweet and sour. I know all these different cool names you've come up with to show what these students are doing intentionally. So let's take a look at the one about Jenna. Jenna, brave like a soldier, yet free like an eagle, is the most passionate person I've ever met. She has a heart like gold. A heart with enough room for everyone she meets. Okay, right there, it just sounds like, oh, she's a great writer. But if you really look at it, Jenna, brave like a soldier, she is using that just like that move. And this was one of the moves that she kind of fell in love with. And you'll see she keeps using it. Um, yet free like an ego. She keeps going through and she talks about her heart of gold. And so it was really powerful to see that this was intentional. She said, you know what, I'm going back to my toolkit and I'm going to put this in here. Let's take a look at um, the first sentence or so of um, my grandma. This is Isaac who wrote about his grandmother who basically raised him as his mom. And so they sat it up 10 minutes to do this and they had a bevy of moves and we said, guys, at least try four or five moves and let's see what he turned up. On the outside, she looked like a defeated person. But on the inside, she was like a ferocious lion full of life. When I read that, I was just like, oh my goodness, he has internalized this move. He has compared her to a ferocious lion. And he was able to tell me, well, right here, I decided to use it just like that move because he had been taught very explicitly. It wasn't that gray area where we talk about add detail or keep going or we hope that they come up with something. So that's another example. We're going to share one more with you and talk about that a little bit too. It's one of my favorites. It's sweet and sour. Oh yeah, you use this a lot with your high school students. They like this one. This one is great because it's able, it, the student is able to give a little bit of the good and a little bit of the bad of whatever they're talking about. And we used to think this wasn't like a real thing, but because we scoured through so many books and really pulled information out, we realized 
authors do this all the time. So let's look at a few examples of how authors actually do this. On your screen, you have a few that are there. We'll read a few out loud in case they're not as clear. Um, let's go to the last one. Oh, yeah. In the early 1930s, Jews made huge contributions to the industrial, social, and artistic life in Germany. But Adolf Hitler, who became chancellor in 1933, blamed them for Germany's defeat in the First World War and its economic crisis. That's and such a good example of a sweet and sour. A really good example because it not only presents the good and the not so good, it really draws on the emotional aspect of it. It really elicits an emotional response from the reader. And we want our kids to know that you intentionally decide what you're going to do. And so when they saw these examples, they saw, wow, that made you really think about the contrast between all the great things that Jewish people did and all the kind of negative consequences. So sweet and sour is you writing about something that was really good, there was something that's not so good. And we found that kids use this the most with informational writing. Um, one of mine is it could be very simple, like the first one, but our successes have not come without consequences. That is simple in contrast to the last one on the screen, but it let them see, give me the sweet, give me the sour. That is a strategy that writers use a lot. And all of these samples that you see here, if we look at the author's name and the text, these are all informational texts because we wanted them to see this is where this move is used most often. And it was really powerful because they got to see what it looks like and they knew it was a real thing, and then now we named it for them. So we'll show you a student sample that used that move. My stepmom, Rachel, also my friend, is a wonderful, beautiful, caring woman. She's a great mother and a wonderful teacher. The most important thing about her is that she cares about everyone and wants to make everybody safe. One example is when I'm sick. She does not worry and makes sure I have everything. Even though sometimes I get in trouble, I love her and I know she loves me too. Right there and throughout this paper, she's using all the moves we taught her. But that sentence that says, even though sometimes I get in trouble, that's her sour. But then she has her sweet. I love her and I know she loves me too. It was so powerful to see that she was able to do this intentionally. And I'm going to go back a little bit, guys. We showed you an earlier um, type of writing. Let me pull that up really quickly. Where we had um, a student that used the just like that move. You remember these two here? And we were focusing on the just like, just like that move. But if you notice, we we'll look at Jenna. Go to the last sentence on the paper that says Jenna. It starts with although, and take a look at that and see if you can figure out what she was doing. Although she is halfway across the world. I still remember her loving and caring presence. So when we first read this, we hadn't talked to you guys about the sweet and sour mood. But when you look at this now, we can see every single sentence is a deliberate mood. And right there, she used the just like that earlier, but at the end, she concluded it with the sweet and sour. So these were the kind of things we started seeing. And this is after literally a few weeks of instruction with the kids. And it was really powerful. And we were just so impressed. So we'll show you another move. Oh, well, a couple more examples of Sweet and Sour, and then we'll kind of move forward to right in the middle. This is my favorite one, and probably our last move that we're going to show you guys. We'll see if we have time to do more. But this was right in the middle, and I loved it because this was really about sentence structure. So what I did, I wrote these sentences up here, and I love to show this because I like for teachers to see real things. Yes, it's crooked. Yes, it's not perfect, but this is real from a real classroom. So I want people to see, hey, this is what it looks like. So I wrote these sentences on the board, and then I tell my kids, nothing's wrong with these. But you know what good writers do? Good writers, they go and put their description right in the middle. And then I took the sense of scripture I see, and I made all of these kind of descriptions. I didn't even tell them the name, but we didn't talk about, are these descriptive clauses? Are these positive phrases? I didn't even worry about that. I said, we're going to drop our description right in the middle. And we looked at these sentence strips, and we revisited our earlier sentences, and we said, well, how can we add description by dropping it right in the middle? And this is what we came up with. We went back to these original cricket sentences, and we said, okay, what can we do here? And you'll notice the first one that says Tara, the little magnet. I have my kids come up any way you can get it up here. Put a magnet, put some tape. We just want to all work on this together. And we tried different combinations, and I shot a picture of this one. So instead of just adding an adjective, instead of saying Tara, is always thoughtful and kind, they saw that, you know what, I can stick my description in between two commas. So instead of saying Tara, my best friend, is always thoughtful and kind. 
And to adults, these seem pretty simple, but kids aren't taught to do this. Look at the second one. Pa, nicknamed Pee Wee, almost tripped over the branch. I deliberately put the dashes in there because I am pulling from real text and I want to give them real examples of what to do. I'm going to pull you guys back from the slide. Okay, so what we really are focusing on is we want to be explicit, pull things from real authors. It's not authentic if you're just telling them something generic and it's not specific. And then you've got to give them time to practice it with you. You guys want to write together, just like the strips I just showed you, my cricket writing on the board. We work together. And then we made those visual aids. We put the charts up. So they had tools to scaffold their writing. And then the fun part, they got to test drive it and try it out. Yes. So that was a big deal. It helped the kids a lot. And we have so many moves. I wish I could talk to you guys for like three hours. <laughs> that would delight my world right now. But we had so many. I'm going to show you just a few names of them, but we can't go through them all. But I think you get the process. I'll show you a few. And um, then we'll kind of talk about the takeaways. All right. Sound good? Sounds good. I know I'm talking for it because I'm so excited when I do this. <laughs> all right. So let's look at just a few more. Um, here's a simple one, guys, called Adverbs Up Front. This was really powerful, not just for little kids, but for high school students. They had been so badgered with the idea that you only begin a sentence with the subject. And they all kept doing that. And we said, you know, guys, I went through some text, and I saw the authors have a different way of doing this. And I showed them a couple examples. You want to read some of these, Chris? Sure. The first one, slowly, one by one, they left. Desperately, the people tried to save the potatoes. We literally just put these on the board. We projected them up there on the screen. And we said, guys, what do these have in common? And they were like, wow, the adverb started at the beginning of the sentence. It didn't matter if that student was seven or 15. They all seemed shocked that this was an actual thing that they could do. And we're kind of like, yeah, that, that's a thing, guys. But when they saw it in real writing, it was so powerful to them. So we show you a really young student that used this. This is a... Um, Honestly, this student, even though our book is for third grade and up, this is a first grader. We basically showed pictures. So this student had two pictures, and I asked them to caption the pictures. And one picture was of a dog looking at owner, and the other one was of um, tennis great Serena Williams hitting a ball. And I said, keep trying this move up, and that's exactly what she did. So she came up with gently, the dog licked its owner. Boldly, Serena knocked the tennis ball as far as she could. And these are the kind of things we did to test drive. And of course, we did lots of anchor charts and other things to practice, but it just really helped the students have options. And once they have those options, they have that toolkit, they are ready to go. They, they really have an opportunity to write and be intentional in their writing. Yes. So, so pretty much takeaways. Yeah. yeah. So um, the main thing we want you to take away is that good writing is easy to achieve. All you have to do is bring and, authentic examples. Exactly, to the students and give them the tools that they need. Give them a couple of different uh, options so that when they're sitting with a blank piece of paper in they front have of them, they have possibilities. They have ways to go, oh, I can explain this like this. Yeah. And it really helps too, um, the names, I know they seem goofy, like zoom in and things like that, but it helped give us a common language. So when we at conference with a kid and I said, what are you trying to do? They can say, well, I wanted to use, you know, adverbs up front here, I wanted to zoom in, and it made our conferences great. It took it from, what are you trying to do, and they're like, well, I don't know, I want to be better, to, hey, this is what I want to do specifically. I want my reader to see this. Okay, well, let's think about some of the tools we have to do that. And it really helped us make our writing classes just yes. go smoothly. And also encourage them when they're reading on their own to try to identify when writers are using those moves, because that'll help reinforce that yes. and help them to think of those things as real things. I think that so was one of our happiest things. moments. After doing this for maybe about three months, our kids started coming going, hey, let's read this book. They're using our move right here. I like, it's not really our move, it's everyone's <laughs> move. But they started finding those things, and they started uncovering moves. At least six or seven moves in the book, 
weren't ones that Chris and I came up with yeah. at all. They were ones that kids were like, hey, I noticed they did this in both of these books. And they started reading like writers. So we were so, so proud of that. So those are our takeaways. I wish we had even more time to talk to you guys. But all these ideas are in the big book of details, all 46, and they're all set up very similarly to this. So very excited to talk to you guys, and I appreciate you spending your Saturday with us. Yeah, uh, Roz and Chris, I just I just want to let you know I, I really enjoyed just um, watching that presentation. It was that last point you just made, um, Roz, about a bunch of your moves actually coming from the students. Yes. Um, I think that speaks so well to the whole idea that that Smokey and Sarah opened up with today about like student curiosity kind of driving yes. the process. So I just wanted, I just noticed that and I was like, I love that point because I think it just shows how real effective teaching a lot of the time is kind of derived from students. Um, yes. But anyway, while you were giving your presentation, um, I did receive a bunch of tweets. Now, most of the tweets were encouraging, like literally dozens of tweets. Um, I'm going to show you one. It's not necessarily a question, but okay. it's kind of a comment that I thought was interesting that can spark a, a brief conversation here. Um, so just give me a moment and I'll share it Sounds with great. you guys. Um, so if you just take a look at my screen, you'll see. Um, do you see that there? Yes, yes. Great. So it said, <clears throat> it was from Elaine Duran, and it said, difficult to add detail. Um, and whoops, I put add detail twice, but difficult to add detail to writing. We added more detail. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> twice. Perfect. <laughs> uh, quite literal interpretation. Um, to writing, when one is not a strong reader, her inquiry aims to, aims to change that. Now, the reason I bring up this tweet is because I'm curious, what is your process? Um, Ooh, for students, question. perhaps, in your classroom that aren't as strong readers, perhaps, as other students? if a lot of these anchor texts maybe are above their level, what's the strategy there? This is such a great question. Um, one of the things we found is, especially because we were both at Title I school, we had a lot of below level readers. Yes. And what we found is that we had to realize that, okay, whatever's happened in the past that has prevented them from being really strong readers, we can't go back and change that. But you know what, maybe we can give them a different way to look at text. And so once we started showing them, hey, look how I was a detective, basically, and I found this in a book, it kind of gave them an extra reason to read. So a lot of those kids who really weren't good readers and really didn't want to get into the text, they found power and a reason to go back in. So a lot of times it was almost like, hey, you know what, I'm just reading this really to look at what this writer is doing. And it was kind of twofold because now we've made you actually read that book. So that was a good thing there. But it gave them another purpose. And I think that's powerful for readers who haven't been successful because in their minds, reading doesn't work for me. I'm not good at it. It's really no point for me to do that. Any number of excuses. Yeah, whatever whatever their issue was. They could have tons of reasons. But we present you with another reason to dig into attack. So that was powerful. We found that was something really cool. And kids are egotistical. They love to show what they have found and learned and figured out, and they like to be able to pr present a move to the rest of the students. Yes. Very cool. Um, yeah, thank you. And uh, just one last question. Um, do you find, because this is something I was just curious about as I was watching, because I really like just putting it in terms of these moves, I think is such a smart idea. And um, I'm just wondering, though, do you find that students are able to synthesize the moves, um, say, at the end of a unit. So instead of it just being, you know, oh, they're really good at the just like move, do you find that they're able to kind of bring them all together um, into good writing pieces? Yes, well, definitely. One of the things we found is that even when they're not trying to, if they know about the move, they're they're able to kind of Almost put subconsciously, it, yeah, subconsciously kind of put it in their writing. Um, so we have uh, several examples where students have written maybe uh, a paragraph or two paragraphs and they've used more moves than they think they have. They have, may have set out to use, for example, the just like that move. Um, but also in there, there's a sweet and sour. Also in there, there's, you know, uh, in That's the, the middle. That's the idea of that toolkit. We yeah, built that toolkit exactly. up. Exactly. And one of the things that we did, which we didn't talk about, uh, talk about, we create writing notebooks at the beginning of the year. We call them our strategy notebooks. And we basically have the kids take the first three pages, leave them blank, and write table of contents. 
And every time we introduce a move, they basically create a new page for that move. So we have page to set just like that. And all the test driving and the practicing we're doing, they do it on that page right there. And sometimes they even make their own mini anchor charts. And then in the table of contents, they write that move and they write the page number. And we kind of just came up with that idea on a lark. But at the end, they had this big notebook full of moves. And uh, the funny story, I worked with a middle school that I had never worked with before. But I had worked with some of their fifth graders the previous year. And these kids were not in sixth grade. And so as I was introducing these moves to the teachers, they were like, oh, our kids already know those. They've been using them. And I was like, how can they already be using them? Those kids had taken their notebooks with them to sixth grade. And they almost felt almost like they were cheating. Like, oh, you want me to write this? Oh, no, I have tons of details right here. Let me just take out my notebook. And the teachers had seen it. And I was so impressed because at the end of the year, the kids are like, I got to take this with me. And they look at it almost like as a writing Bible. Like, this is how you elaborate. And it just, I don't know, it made us feel so excited that yeah. they could do that. That a lot of your kids, when they were applying to college, they used some of those things in their um, admissions. So the admissions essays and things <laughs> yes. like that. Yeah. And they came back. Even their freshman so year in college. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's no. really cool because these are authentic. It's not something that I'm teaching you from the fifth grade curriculum or from the eighth grade curriculum. We have uncovered things that authors actually do. And I think we can all do that by digging into so really powerful with that. I, no, I think that's awesome. I, I love that idea of like students because when I think of students at the end of the year, what they do with their notebooks, <laughs> it's like <laughs> how, many, how many pages can I rip out? How quickly? <laughs> Something I can burn this book in? Yes, yes. Uh, you know, <laughs> um, but the fact that you said the students are bringing it from year to year so they can like yes, oh. all those moves. I can't imagine how powerful that is. Yes. Um, like their book of like secret codes. I, I know. Yes, I think that's, exactly. Yes. I like that. We should start calling it that. Codes. the book of secret codes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Um, well, from Twitter, it's clear a lot of people got a lot out of this uh, workshop today. I personally really enjoyed the workshop and learning from both of you. So I want to thank you on behalf of the Ed Collab and just say thank you for coming out and, uh, and uh, sharing your time with us thank and with you. Thank you for, for having us. Yes, this was so fun. So fun. Thank you so much, Ryan. It's no problem at all. Have a great day and I'll see you at a later session, I'm sure. Definitely. Bye-bye. Bye. And um, for everyone else, um, as you know, this was only session two, so we have plenty more sessions to go. What I want to do with you is now share um, just some of the other sessions that we have for you um, coming up. So, um, as you can see on the screen right now, uh, we have Workshop 10, which is a pre-recorded session by Chris Lehman, who is the founder of the Ed Collab, so definitely something you want to check out. Uh, workshop 11 is Mary Howard and Linda Hoyt, um, maximizing deep thinking and reflection through independent reading and read aloud. Um, so if you're a K through five teacher, you might want to check that one out at one o'clock in about 15 minutes. Uh, workshop 12, also at, at one, along with everything from session three, um, is Amy Rasmussen and Shana Carnes, and that's choice as the keystone in secondary English classes. So that's great if you're a high school or middle school teacher. And workshop number 13 um, is the Institute of Playing Quest to Learn um, by uh, Rebecca Rufo Tepper and Rachel Valone, and that is game based teaching strategies for the student centered classroom. And that's going to work on pretty much any grade level. And one last thing not to forget is uh, today's adopted charity is Doctors Without Borders. So this has been entirely free today. So just keep in mind that the money maybe you would have spent on this PD that you're getting from all these amazing professionals. Um, perhaps you'd consider um, throwing a couple dollars toward that charity. And thank you again for coming out and watching. And um, Hopefully, you stick around and check out one of those great um, workshops for session three. Have a great day.